I want to get a little bit more said about Schumann today, so that we next time can go on to the songs directly. Anyone, any other brilliant ideas about romantic music? Maybe the only thing that should be mentioned there is that, of course, the poetry of those days also had its influence on it. And as the uh, musicians were great readers, it didn't take them long to, to catch the spirit of it. And of course, two poets you may not be at all familiar with, probably were the ones that influenced Schumann most, who in his way probably was the, in the core of the German romantic music. And that is Jean Paul, J-E-A-N, P-A-U-L. His original name was Jean, Jean Paul Richter. And uh, he wrote some rather lengthy novels, most famous is Die Flegel Jahre. There is no real translation the rascal years, of, I mean, the, the description of a very young boy changing into a man gradually. And the other, who may sound a little more familiar, are is uh, three initials, E, T, A, Hoffman, who was an extremely talented, many-sided man. He was a, a very good novelist, and he was also a classical composer. Very nice romantic music. You would definitely feel what period it was written in. And you would say, yeah, it's a professional. I mean, it's not the greatest genius of all of this professional music. There's no doubt about it. And of course, the work that brings us closest to Schumann is the, the memoirs, the memoir and this Cartus Moore, that's his name, M U W R. And the whole idea, of course, is already startling. There, were, uh, there is uh, a musician, a conductor, by the name of Kreisler, spelled like the German Kreisler, not the car, Kapellmeister Kreisler, who wrote an autobiography on single sheets. And the cat wanted to write his own autobiography. So he took some of those sheets and wrote on the back side his biography. And of course it is made so that they overlap to a certain extent. One breaks off and you think we're just at the most exciting moment. And then some of the 40 pages later in the story, the cat reports the solution of this thing that started on, on Chrysler, you see? So, it's extremely, extremely clever, and uh, given the name to Chryslerianna, the Schumann piano pieces, which means sort of pieces in the spirit of of this work, you know, this crazy musician of the races in and out, seemingly, and the uh, there are many, many indications of it in in some of the works. It, I don't believe there is an English translation. I have tried several times. I even wrote to Washington at the, at the National Library there, and I thought if we couldn't find it, then there probably isn't any. And it's a shame because it, it gives you such a good picture of the, of the idea of the crazy musician of those days, you see. And he, he makes fun of it in a fairly benevolent way, actually because he was one himself. So they, they started this trend that led us, of course, towards the whole idea of program music. And there you will see a quite different trend in uh, Chopin, we can't say program music. It's escape titles of dance forms or something like that, or ballad or something like that. But there is no, uh, this is really not program in that sense, though, People have worked out very carefully what each note means now in the ballads, and I don't know how much of it to believe, and I don't know how much I care to believe in the first place. 
I don't think it makes a bit of difference. So Mendelssohn, of course, has a certain amount of names. Nevertheless, he's not too interested either. I mean, he I, I mentioned last time something about this thing, and I think I have it here, where he says somebody asked him to give him the meanings of some of the songs without words of the piano pieces to see whether he had a definite feeling there where the, the, there are words on it that are just not, not written there. And, uh, and I'm starting in the middle of it. The thoughts which are expressed to me by music that I love are not too indefinite to be put into words, but on the contrary, too definite. You see? I mean, if you think that through for a split second, this is an, an excellent little trick there, you see? Because we sometimes say, well, I, I don't know what, what this phrase can mean. I wish you would give me an explanation, you see? And he says, well, if I can give you an explanation, then I write you a letter, then why bother expressing it in music? This can only be expressed in music because that makes it so that everyone can understand. And so I find in every effort to express such thoughts that something is right, but at the same time, that something is lacking in all of them. If you ask me what I was thinking of when I wrote it, I would say, just the song as it stands. And if I happen to have made certain words in mind for one or another of these songs, I would never want to tell them to anyone because the same words never mean the same things to different people. Only the song can say the same thing and arouse the same feelings in one person as in another, a feeling which is not expressed, however, by the same words. It's rather interesting. Of course, I believe there is a little point of disagreement that, that uh, music doesn't always mean the same either. I mean, there are certain moments, for instance, in Mozart where I feel like crying, and other people say, isn't it cute? You see, so, I mean, uh, <laughs> something like that. Mm -hmm. So that it can happen. Now, let's talk a little bit about Schumann. I want to give just, again, a tiny little bit of section of his biography, actually, as to what concerns us, and in which way he is different from most of the other masters. 1810 to 1856, he was born in the then rather small town of Zwickau, Z-W-I-C-K-A-U, in Saxonia, and miserably, of course, in Endenich. This is where I brought the end up, which was an insane asylum near Bonn, so in 56. Uh, we have here another case, as I said, of a rather well-to-do and rather cultured family. His father was actually a frustrated poet, and they, to us it seems a little bit odd. He seemingly didn't make enough money as a writer, and so he had a grocery store, and that's probably the first one able to do a thing like that. He started selling books in this. I mean, this is, this is uh, for us nowadays, with supermarkets, is a very common thing, but think of an old uh, small town. Grocery store, I mean, I walk in a grocery store, and you know, people go to And gradually, he was able to get rid of the grocery store and only at the bookstore, where he started not only selling books, but also writing them, translating old, old Greek literature, and I don't know what else. So that there was definitely an atmosphere of high standing around, around Robert to start out with. Now, it uh, is, uh, it has to be said that as a youngster, Robert Schumann had, pro had probably all the unpleasant qualities a person can have. He, he, he was, he drank, he was, he made bets all over the place. He was terribly selfish. He, he lived of self-pity. When you read the letters to his parents, please don't write me anything sad. I just can't take it. It ruins me. So, I mean, everything, it, it's really quite, it's quite unpleasant. I mean, he was always badly in debt, quite selfish, never helped a soul when they asked him for anything. So, 
we have to face that fact that this guy really turned on the most unattractive youngster. To, to the, I mean, a spoiled kid that didn't know what to do with himself. The moment his professional was set, and his aim towards his future wife was set, his whole, whole outlook on life changed, and he became probably one of the finest and what is it, most good-hearted or best-hearted people in, in the field of music. He was not quite sure whether he was going to be a composer in the first place. He also wrote poetry. The father wanted him to study law, so he went to Heidelberg, studied law, and the only thing that held him there is that one of his law professors was a musician, and uh, they got to, to talk and to, to make music together and so on. And then his father died around that time, and that gave him a certain freedom. The mother wasn't strong or energetic enough to force him to finish his law degree with you. So then he suddenly decided, well, so I'm going to be a pianist. And uh, he went, went off to, to, in 1830, to see Mr. Friedrich Wieck in Leipzig. You, you might notice that all of a sudden the towns of Leipzig and Dresden become extremely preponderant. So for one generation or so, the weight is shifting away from Vienna into this neighborhood. Because we find a whole bunch from Mendelssohn, Weber, Mendelssohn, the great romantics, and Wagner having a center in this, in this sphere of of southern Saxonia. Then, then the re-migration towards Vienna started again. Anyhow, the, uh, he went to he went to Wieck in 1830 and started uh, practicing seemingly quite peace, except that in, in his obsession, which uh, I mean already indicated itself to a certain extent around that time, he tried, as you might have known, anyhow, this odd experimentation of trying to separate the third and fourth fingers by some device of hooking that finger up on a string and leading it across to the other side of the of the board or whatever this is called and letting a weight hang down so to, to make sure that the third and fourth become more independent which of course doesn't go because they aren't you see they, they, they are grown together on one muscle here, we can't do much about it. So with the result, the trouble, and he had to quit for a while, and then he tried again, and it, it came to, uh, to a status where he knew that as a career, piano playing will not be possible, because he had himself, so to speak, beyond repair. And this may have been a blessing in disguise, because that way he said, look, was to compose much more than, than he did before. And his interest, as you know, stayed completely on piano music for, for several more years. And his first 23 opus numbers straight through, without one exception, all piano. Nevertheless, he already had all sorts of sideline experiments. He was interested in writing. and. Founded the Neue Zeitschrift für Musik, 